Morning, everyone. <coughs> Good morning. Um, Kelly, are you going to explain the house brick? Is that in the plan? Yeah, it's in the plan. Okay, you great. start, and then I'll Brilliant. bring the house brick. Hello, 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 hello. Morning, everyone. <laughs> it's great to be here with all of you uh, this morning. This morning, and thank you for that um, kindness, Claire. Um, yeah, this is our, our last proper pre, certainly our last one together as a couple. Um, we'd really love you to come along. Please invite your friends. Don't worry about space. We'll fit everyone in. Um, next Sunday, 3 o'clock, there isn't going to be a morning service here, but we can be having our final service here, the two of us, next Sunday, 2nd of April at 3 p.m. So nothing in the morning, just at 3 p.m. We'd really love you to come. We um, count it as such a, an honour and a privilege to have been part of this church for the time we have, and we'd love you to come and um, celebrate uh, with us. And this morning we're going to... Uh, but yeah, having a bit of a tag team effort, it's kind of going to be a little bit, hopefully, uh, funnier than the Chuckle Brothers, but it'll be a little bit to me, to you, to me, to you, okay? I love the Chuckle Brothers, actually. They're brilliant. And um, yeah, we're going to be looking back at our time at Live Church Lincoln and uh, through the eyes of some of our favourite songs, um, just to bring a little bit of humour into things. Some of those songs won't... Act I'm, I feel a little bit embarrassed are, are in there in a way because they're either to Kelly's choice or they're just a bit of a cheesy one, but they kind of fit what we're trying to say. Um, but they, uh, they, they hopefully fit what we're trying to say at that very moment. And um, the title of our message this morning is, But God. But God. There's loads of occasions throughout the Bible when the, the words, but God, or things that denote a similar, uh, a similar meaning take place and at every juncture that we go through we're going to take you on a bit of a whistle stop tour through our uh, time at life church over the many years and we want to look back and we want to thank god for his direction his help his faithfulness his love his grace his mercy and so many other things it was like when claire was saying this morning at the very start of the service about the names of god there are so many names of god and there are so many different particular things that we have uh, to be thankful for. And part of the reason we want to do that is we, want to, we don't want to be nostalgic so much as we want to look back and thank God for what he's done. But I hope it will stir your faith, whether you're here in the building, whether you're watching live online or watching back later on, I hope it will really stir your faith wherever you are right now. When you look back and you see how much God has done, you can say, do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. We need more we need you, and we want to believe for even more as we move into the future with you. And I'm going to tell you about The Rock. As we were preparing this message, we've looked back over the last 20 years of our lives, and uh, I've been through a hundred journals, probably, um, that I've kept over the years. But as we were worshipping this morning in the prayer meeting before we started, I was reminded of 1 Samuel 7, where it says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up. And he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So I've brought you an example. In the Old Testament, we may have had a rock of help, an Ebenezer. But today, we're going to, in the flesh, um, kind of share with you the way that God has helped us over the last 20 years. Yeah, so looking back to... We were going to start 2003 when Kelly and I got married, but I thought it would be even better than that to look back to 96 years before that in 1997. I never thought as um, a, a tender lad in 1997 that I'd be married six years later, and yet there we were. <laughs> um, this church was actually planted from a church that was then known as New Life Christian Fellowship in Lincoln. It's now known as a live church. And uh, it was planted with my father as like the founding senior pastor, and he had a number of other really wonderful, helpful people who came alongside him as the leadership team, including Bill Toynton, who's here today, and Jackie McAlevey a little bit later, who's here today as well. And loads of other people have played such a wonderful part over the years. And, for me, uh, and I'm going to be really honest here. For many years, I've kind of oscillated from being actively involved, uh, where Bill taught me to set up the entire sound desk myself, and break it down again. Uh, but I oscillated between that and kind of being very much, I never kind of spent long periods out of church, partly because my dad would have just made my life not really worth living, so it wasn't really worth it. I told you I was gonna be honest, didn't I? And, um, and so, so I kind of went from being really involved to being like very much present in body, but not very 
present in spirit. Kelly and I married at the tender age. We were both 19. You turned 20 about two days later, didn't you, while we were on honeymoon? Um, in 2003, so you can guess our age now, if you don't already know. Um, we had our daughter, Bella, when we were 20. And for a few months after our marriage, we got a little bit firing as we were like, no, we need to go our own way. We, we're going to be like, if people are going to know us as our own people, we need to be in a different church. And we did, and we were part of a different church for a few months. And then we realized, I don't know if this might, I've got the feeling this might speak to someone, someone who's watching this. We realized we made a mistake. We realized we were actually in the right place at the right time. It's just we didn't realize it, but we kind of needed to go out in order to realize that and um, I'd really broken my dad's heart in particular Kelly a bit as well by um, not being part of this church for just a few short months uh, but we came back I just said to him dad um, we we messed up and he was like don't worry about it just come back and we did which was great it made me think we welcomed back so lovingly and it really made me think in action of the, um, the prodigal son in Luke uh, chapter number 15 and the, this church began in 1997 in hopeful and visionary and yet in many ways lacking and imperfect circumstances. Bill will raise a smile. Bill and Edna will raise a smile at that bit. So you'll know what I'm talking about. And there are similarities with that in my life as well. Um, one writer once said, however, but God brings hope when we can't see a way through. But God means ashes aren't the end of our story. And but God says God, not our circumstances, always gets the last word. God doesn't just redeem us for himself. He redeems our stories for himself. And we have so many but God moments in our lives and in this church, even just in re very recent times. And so many times God has guided us through the impossible, helped us to believe for the improbable, and rescued us from the intimidating as well. And as it says in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and he said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Awesome. And so that section we named Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> My, uh, my story, my next contribution, um, we chose the, the title When September Ends uh, by Green Day. And it's because um, I just wanted to tell you a story that I had really only given my life to Jesus at the beginning of 2003. And um, I was just starting out my journey of faith, all whilst getting married, having a baby, and it all seemed a little bit overwhelming. And at times I was questioning, well, how do I pray? If I find the time to have a quiet time with this baby, what does that even look like? How do I read my Bible? At the time as well, James was um, in church, but he wasn't in church, if you know what I mean. He came, but he wasn't really paying attention. So sometimes it all felt a little bit isolating. But God was really kind and surrounded me with a great family and friends and life group. And it was absolutely clear to me that my only option was to press into Jesus and to prioritize my church family as much as possible. When you have small children, it can feel really isolating. You may be prone to think, what's the point of even going to church? I don't get to hear the word. I'm always out in the creche. But the Bible tells us in Psalm 127 that children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward for him. And in Psalm 22 verse 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. These years that we sow into our children, when we demonstrate that we prioritize Jesus and his church, and our children get to experience the preciousness of children's ministry, are so important. Our daughter isn't currently walking with the Lord as closely as we'd like at the moment, but in my conversations with her, I see the foundations that were laid in those precious few years of her life. And you know with modern technology, it's always possible to catch up in the week, which is awesome. And even in those days, you could get a recording on a CD. It was, it was good. Or a tape. I'm not quite that old. It's... <laughs> 
it's very easy to want to skip forward these years and say, wake me up when September ends. But God uses this time and nothing goes to waste. If you're in this position, I encourage you to keep going. And if you see someone who's in that position, why not consider how you can help and support them? After all, we're a family, aren't we? And I'm going to continue for, to our next phase. So we're around 2008 now. And I've called this What's My Age Again by Blink-182. <laughs> you can tell what music we listened to when we were growing up. Um, as a Christian, it's so important that you surround yourself with godly people and find encouragement in the body of Christ. It helps us to be encouraged, to be held accountable, to grow in the knowledge of the Lord and to become more like Jesus. I'm doing a study at the moment in Second Chronicles and there are so many examples of where poor company corrupts good kings. I was reading only on Friday of Joash, a good and faithful king of Judah who was supported by a wise priest. And when the priest died, Joash ended up in the wrong crowd, listening to the wrong voices and they led him astray. And he had started so well, but he ended his reign worshipping false gods, murdering a prophet of the Lord, defeated and injured in battle, and being murdered in his own bed by his own men. One of the amazing ways in which we can surround ourselves with godly, good people is to be in small groups or families, as we call them here. I was in the most amazing life group when I first joined Life Church, with people who were at varying stages of their faith, and there was a wealth of experience, and it was edifying. I was still in my early 20s, a relatively new Christian, but I found myself in a position where the leaders of the group were moving on, and the group might need to fold. I felt this sort of holy frustration come over me. I didn't want the group to fold, and I didn't see anyone else who was willing to stand up and take the charge. And I was sat on the sidelines going, come on, who's going to do something about this? I felt that Jesus was asking me to be bold and to step up to the plate. But all I could do in my own mind was disqualify myself. I'm too young. I'm not knowledgeable enough. There must be someone better, hence why I've called this section what's my age again? But God impressed it further and further into my heart over a period of a couple of weeks. And as I was praying and seeking him, he gave me a scripture, which you'll all be well versed in, I'm sure, of 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And also 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, which says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Jesus Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. As I stepped into this role that I felt wholly unprepared for, I knew that I had to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, and that any success I had was not a result of my, my um, ability. My obedience, yes, but not my ability. Because it is God to whom I must give all the glory. Our weaknesses are made perfect in his power. And I want to encourage you that when you hear the call of God on your life, be obedient and do what he's asking. Think not of all the ways in which you are weak but in all of the ways that he is strong. Put your trust in him and let him lead you. Amen. Amen. Just a brief intersection for me. 2009, I uh, was asked by my father to go to Portugal with him for a long weekend. I thought, oh, fantastic. 
Um, but it was actually for a week of the ministry, which was still great, uh, although we didn't get to go to the coast. Um, and we were going to be, um, I was going to be sort of just sort of helping him really, carrying his bags, as he used to say, at the Igreia uh, Rivera churches in uh, Lisbon. And um, I knew we'd be in for a great time, and I had my tickets booked, and I was really looking forward to it. Um, but just before, Kelly, I, if you can not laugh in this section, then I will give you five pounds, okay? She won't be able to do it. <laughs> Um, just before I, we went, I had an accident. Some of you might, who were around at the time might remember it. Um, I fainted and walked into a door frame and broke, had a dental accident. So the song for this section is, All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Next slide, please. <laughs> I, I kind of got it partly repaired, but I had to go to Lisbon with a massive... It wasn't just like one tooth at the back or something like that, right at the front. Very notable. So I was talking to everyone like this most of the time. Um, apart from one moment where I got really bold, my dad asked me to share something. I shared something from, uh, from the book of James about uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of any kind. And I showed the whole church. I was like, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to show people how you it might only be a little thing in some ways. Uh, but yeah, I was, uh, yeah, whittle out a whistle. So this began kind of loads of dental work for me, and I had to go to Portugal with no uh, front teeth, which was a shame. There was a guy in the church who actually offered to fix my teeth for me while I was there, and I was like, do you know what, I'll be all right, thank you. I don't know. <laughs> this is quite crucial. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll be okay for now. Um, so this was, uh, it was, it was a kind of a, a difficult time, but I really enjoyed it. And there was something that weekend that even though I was a little bit, I wasn't really at the place where I was taking real responsibility in church. But I know, especially looking back, that God did something. But God, he did something in me that particular long weekend in Portugal. And I look back now to my baptism verse which I remember at the time thinking that's really strange and obscure, and yet I've seen it become more and more relevant the older I've got. And I believe that God kicked something into gear that weekend. It was from Proverbs 24, 27, and it says this, Put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. I didn't think then that I had much of a future, especially within the church, the kingdom, church circles, things like that. But I think, looking back, God had other plans. Well done for not laughing. I didn't laugh. Did, did she laugh? <coughs> I, didn't, no. I wasn't looking at her. That's oh, very well behaved. Drama student. She can manipulate her emotions. Yeah. So, um, I do. if you know me in any small way, you will know that I'm a drama queen. It's just a fact. I've loved acting and singing my whole life at school and at university. I regularly got opportunities to perform and often received really good feedback. And when I started coming to church, I loved worship music. And I was desperate to join the worship team. I excitedly joined the team as a backing vocalist and hoped to one day be leading worship for myself. Of course, I loved Jesus and I wanted to worship him. But there was also a part of me that was extremely prideful. And any kind of um, ministry gift that requires you to stand up in front of people, preaching, leading meetings, prophesying in the worship team, you're at risk often of pride creeping in. As time went by, I saw more and more people pass over me and get opportunities, and I started to be a little bit bitter. Has anybody ever been in a situation like that? What about me? Why, why aren't I getting these opportunities? Hence the title of this section is You're So Vain by Carly Simon. But one year, I was plagued with terrible tonsillitis. It had been a problem my whole life, but was now becoming a real area of weakness. And I found myself, in the most part, unable to sing. This caused me to have a bit of an identity crisis, because how could I worship if I couldn't sing? But God arrested me during this time and highlighted my proud heart. 
I went through a period of real repentance and began to appreciate the true, true joy of worshipping the Lord. I came to understand that worship was not just singing, but was an outpouring of our hearts and a submission of our lives in the everyday. And it is absolutely nothing to do with me and absolutely everything to do with him. This time in my life was revolutionary as I put my flesh to death and worshipped Jesus in spirit and in truth. I ended up having surgery to remove my tonsils, which was a blessed relief, and also how James lost his two front teeth. Um, and I rejoined the worship team, this time with my priorities straight. I had a passion and a determination to lead people into worship. He could use me as he saw fit, and most importantly, I'd come to a place in my heart where he could not use me at all. And you know what? He did use me. We have our plans and desires, but God knows the right time and the right place for us to step into them. Normally, when we no longer hold on to those things as idols in our lives, and we are wholly submitted to him and his will. I'd encourage you in whatever skill or calling you have to seek God and submit yourselves to him and remember that all the praise, all the glory, all the honor belong to him. Let's not get too full of our self-importance and get carried away believing our own press. Oh, it's still me. The next story I want to share with you, um, we think it was around 2011. Naomi and I couldn't get to the right date. But I'm calling this section Unintended, which is a Muse song. And this is because I want to tell you about the time that Naomi, my sister-in-law, asked me to go with her to Soul Survivor, which is a Christian youth event. She was taking the youth but wanted some help with cooking, basically. So I love helping and I love cooking, so I thought, why not? Sounds great. And as I said my enthusiastic yes, I had no idea what I was actually signing myself up for or the unintended consequences. But God did. We were in an evening meeting one night and sang that song, you know, Break My Heart for What Breaks Yours, which I'm sure we all sing flippantly and don't really think about the, the meaning of it. And then Mike Pilavarchi came out and he said, let's pray and let's ask God to show us his heart and break our hearts for what breaks his. And in that moment, I had this overwhelming sense of love and compassion for our young people. And it was incredible. And it led me onto one of the greatest honors of my life being a youth leader. I have loved and served the youth for well over 10 years, and it has been the most immense privilege to be a small part of their journey of faith. We can think that we're just being faithful and serving in something seemingly insignificant and ordinary like cooking. But God has greater plans and purposes. And I want to encourage you to continue to serve as the Lord leads, no matter how small the task. And he will use your obedience, not only to bless your life, but the lives of others. Oh, man, that's brilliant. <clears throat> but God, around about this point in my life, I was still in church, not very active. And being really honest and authentic, I was feeling really lost, really confused about life, I guess. Things were not planning, planning out the way I thought they were going to. I'd had all of these hopes and dreams and desires, and you know, I was really happy to be married and to have kids, but so there was just something not right, something not right. And um, from childhood, a lot of people had spoken prophetically about uh, me going into church leadership and being a pastor and a preacher and things like that. But I just, I didn't want to do it. I would rather do anything in the world, the most horrendous, disgusting, inconvenient job in the world. Partly because I saw how hard it is. I saw how tough it is. I saw what it did to my dad. I didn't want to do it. Can I just say at this juncture... Churches at the moment are killing off, as in people are killing church leaders. Don't let the leaders in this church be the next ones because you've 
made their job so difficult. Please love them. If you need to say something, don't write them a nasty letter. Those days, please don't do that. Don't send a nasty email. Just go and talk and say, can I have a chat with you about this? I'm concerned about it. It's plagued me for years, and I, I got fed up with it. And I'm not going to miss that. And I'm determined that when I'm in church, in your position in the pews and not preaching, I'm not going to make life hard for leaders. Please love them. Sorry if that stings. Actually, I'm not sorry. I don't care. I want <laughs> our church, the church leaders here to feel, yeah, to feel... I love these people. And you know what? Yeah, we've got our challenges. Yeah, no, we need to do something about that particular thing. Please love them. You can be truthful. You can share an opinion. Please do it in love. And if you can't do it in love, don't do it at all. Okay? Thank you. I told my parents, I remember one particular afternoon, we'd come back from church. I was quite relieved to be back at their house, to be quite honest. And uh, we were pre prepping lunch together. And I said something, and my mum just said, oh, James, you're so pastoral. You should get working with your dad. And I turned around. I looked her. Well, I was talking to her, but I looked him in the eyes, and I said, I will never, ever, ever be a church leader. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. I've never met, actually, a church leader, a, a, one who's kind of meant to be doing it, who had the ambition to do it. And I was another one because God, there was just something irresistible. I couldn't not do it. He called me in and I just had to do it. I had to be obedient to him. One weekend, someone very prophetically gifted gave me an incredible word. In many ways, it was a very simple word, but it cut me right to the heart. And this guy said, he said, James, I just see you. Like, God, the way that God sees you is like you're Superman. You've got so much in there to give. You've got such an incredible destiny. You just need to walk into it. God, but God, he had other plans. The following week, my mum bought me a T-shirt with the, you know, the Superman S in the shield. And she said, I want you to remember that word. And I was like, Mom, I'm already there. I don't like this song, but it was literally like a ray of light by Madonna. <laughs> Tom likes Madonna, doesn't he? <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm joking. Something clicked. It was like God had shone a ray of light on me. I just changed in an instant. I thought my life was like, this is never going to be what I hoped it would be. But God had other plans. Something just clicked, and I just, I honestly, I changed in a moment. There were other things about me that took a bit longer, but it, in generally in a macro sense, I just changed in a moment. I suddenly felt I knew who God was. I knew what he was asking of me. I knew how much he loved me and cared for me, how gracious he'd been to me throughout my whole life, even when I wasn't putting him first. I suddenly, and this is a thing, Jim Packers, the theologian, said this. When you really begin to get what God is saying about you, who God says you are, you suddenly, the, many of the problems of life just suddenly find a sensible place. It's like things just begin to slot into place. I began to feel just comfortable in my own skin in a way I don't think I had since I was a little child. I'd been plagued with all kinds of insecurity and just suddenly these things just melted away and I just felt happy to be me. It sounds simple, but it was life-changing for me. I love Kelly more. I love my kids more. And I just said to my dad, if you want me to do it in church, I will do it. I'll clean the toilets. I'll serve coffee. I'll marshal in the car park if you need me to. I'll help Bill T with his drainage rods even. Actually, I don't know if I went that far. Because Vic got there first. <laughs> you were already down the drain, weren't you? I couldn't find you. <laughs> so they'll cut the grass. I'll, I'll do anything. I just want to serve God's people. And I, I was happy doing whatever. Because I just felt like I was home. If you're not serving God's people in some way, please just talk to Pete. Talk to the office. They'll give, they'll give you a job. If you're not currently doing something, you really need to do it. I just loved suddenly the sense of helping. I remember 
just beginning to get opportunities. I didn't, I was kind of eager, but I didn't push myself forward. We began to get opportunities to start leading more meetings, got one or two opportunities to preach, uh, which was massively scary for me because I hated public speaking. 2008, when my brother got married, I hated the first three days of, got married in Frankfurt, I hated the first three days we were there, simply because I was terrified about giving the best man speech. And this guy said to me afterwards, James, I can see a preacher in you there. Um, that wasn't a very good accent, he was American, living in Germany. But Claire will be able to do a better accent tomorrow, won't you, when he goes to Florida. Have you going to Florida, by the way? Uh, I think tomorrow. Oh, right, yeah. You've not mentioned it. I know. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to like Wisby tomorrow or somewhere like that. <laughs> I'm going to Scaventhorpe. Oh, you put you in the blue sky. Yeah, I remember what it looked like, thanks. Um, I remember at this time just feeling, I remember Ke- that summer Kelly and I went on holiday to France where her dad was living at the time and we actually, he lived very close to the border of Spain and we actually flew out of Girona Airport, North Barcelona, didn't we? We had about a two hour journey to get back to the airport and I just remember saying to Kelly, should we just pray for that two hours? Because I just Which feel was like revolutionary. FYI. Yeah, I just never used to see things like that. And I just remember suddenly just thinking, do you know what? I'm so excited about the future for the first time ever. This ray of light had shone on me, and but God, He had other plans. And then 2014, disaster strikes. Uh, that same summer, actually, um, as Kelly and I were praying in the car, my father. William Prentice, he got sick on holiday. It was um, around about the time that we'd been away. And I got this call saying that he was really poorly. They'd been on the cruise and he had to go to the ship's doctor. Cut a long story short, he died from cancer in early 2014. He was only 60. And the cancer absolutely ravaged him. And it shocked a lot of people. It left the church without a senior pastor. And we had no kind of contingency plan. My dad would have thought that was to have a contingency plan equaled a lack of faith. I would just say it's sensible planning, but there you go. <laughs> there were, when we had his funeral service in March 2014, the number of people, we had it at a live church in town, they were very kind and hosted us, and the number of people there, I was really shocked, because my dad was popular and a lot of people knew him. I think, though, the number of people there was also partly down to the shock that a lot of people had that had gone at the age he had. And just in the last few days of his life, the song for this moment is Blackbird by the Beatles. Because a few days before he died, he had very little strength, but he started to sing this song. And I can't now hear this song without feeling just... I just see it in a completely new way. I always knew the song, and I love the Beatles. (laughs) But I hear it differently now. I can't hear this song without thinking of him. There were words spoken over the church over many years. And so many people in that time after we'd lost my dad, and I honour all of them, Bill, Jackie, Pete, others, we kind of got on and said, we had a defiance about us, and we said, we are not going to let this church die with my dad. Because there are words spoken over this church. I was being passionate, I'm not angry there, by the way. Some of you look shocked at me. This wonderful group of people came together to sort of lead the church together. Pete and I just suddenly got loads of time to preach. I remember saying to Pete, I feel totally ill-equipped for this, but who, where, where else would we ever get an opportunity like this? We were, in, we were up the creek without a paddle, as my dad used to say. But God delivered us from despair to destiny. Amen. Partly because we said, yes, Lord, we will do it. What is God calling you this morning to say yes to? What is he calling you to say yes to that you don't want to do, but you know he's calling you to do? We kind of thought for a while things were getting better, and then disaster struck again. Disaster part two. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but only one year later, we found out that James's mum, Alison, was also sick, and she died in March of 2016. I called this section Song 2 by Blur, because when it was happening, we couldn't believe it was happening all over again. It was like life was being played and repeat. After William had died, we'd all managed to regroup and go again, even though it was really hard. And life was just feeling like it was getting back to some sense of normality when we found ourselves back in the chaos all again. 
not just personally, but as a church, how could we survive this a second time? It was heartbreaking, frustrating, and exhausting. But God, because during this time, it was incredibly hard to keep going and pressing forward, especially when dealing with such great personal pain and having to lead the church through it. But God reminded me again and again and again of his faithfulness. A scripture that that kept coming to mind and I meditated on day and night was from Lamentations 3, 21 to 26. And it says this, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And as I pursued God and pressed in and waited on him and reminded my soul of his faithfulness, we bravely took steps into the future. Hour by hour, morning by morning. I once heard someone say, if you're hanging on by a thread, let it be the thread of his garment. In our own strength, it was not possible But in God's strength, all things are possible. I want to encourage you that when things happen that are the realizations of your worst fears and nightmares, not only is God in them with you and for you, but as you press into him, he will give you the strength to persevere. As it says in Isaiah 40, they who wait for the Lord will renew their strength be encouraged today. Whatever you're facing, he's with you and you can trust him. Amazing. Amen. Next section. Um, I started working for the church as um, full-time in uh, January, 1st of January 2015. Uh, And uh, I was full-time as a staff pastor and then became lead pastor of the church in March 2017. And um, despite all the challenges we had personally and within the church, I just loved, I loved it. And I felt like I was doing just what I should be doing with my life at that very moment, just where I was at. It was like, as the song says, I just couldn't get enough. (laughs) God has never left nor nor forsaken me, even in my darkest moments. And he's always helped the church to keep moving forward. I was the guy, remember, who felt like he had no future, but God gave me dignity and destiny and a life that I decided to rededicate to him. I didn't have a lot of time for myself in the past. I didn't like the person that I was. But God began to speak something new over me. As we, you know, as a young pastor coming through, I had so many obstacles. I had so many people who didn't, despite the pain we were going through, who loved and supported us, and so many people who, Christians these are, who in that moment, a young guy trying to make his way forward just spat poison at me. You're not good enough, you're too young. You'll never make it. And I reminded myself regularly of a few passages, but it includes 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. I don't know if you feel like that, if you feel weak and foolish. And if you do, then good, because God can use you. And it's actually the best state in which, when you're not relying on your own strength and your own intellect to move forward, because in God's plan, you can do anything. We're coming into land just to give you some hope. Um, I want to talk now about 2018. And um, I titled this Never Going to Give You Up by Rick Astley. James looks a bit like Rick Astley, don't you think? Do the Astley roll? Yeah. I, I don't know. I can't remember. Yep. 
In 2018, I'd started an amazing job in Birmingham. Everything was going well, when all of a sudden, I started to get these really bad headaches. They got so bad that I ended up at the GP desperate for some answers. I genuinely felt... I know I have a tendency towards the dramatic, okay? But I did actually genuinely feel like I might die. And uh, this catapulted me and my family into a really trying time. I was admitted into hospital with a suspected bleed on the brain. I was informed that it might be because of some increased intracranial pressure in my brain. I had to have multiple very painful lumbar punctures and scans and all sorts of things. And there was, to all intents and purposes, a real chance that I might actually be really extremely poorly and potentially in a life-threatening situation. This was terrifying for me and for my family, but particularly for James and the children. I was in hospital for 10 days, and one night I was in my hospital bed on my own, and uh, I was on an outlier ward, so there was just me on this whole ward, and um, I just cried and cried and cried and cried, and I cried out to God, and I asked Jesus to save me in that moment. I was reading scriptures and was reminded of Psalm 20, uh, 73, 26, which says, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And in that moment, I just praised God and worshipped him and thanked him for my life. I prayed that I would be healed and thanked God um, that he was the strength of my heart. But I also declared that regardless of the outcome, he was my portion forever. And I was so grateful that my eternity was secure in him. I had this overwhelming sense of calm and peace come upon me. And I was reminded that regardless of the outcome, he was never going to let me down. And he was never going to give me up. The great news is that while still being very painful, uh, there was a simple reason for my pain. I was discharged and now I'm able to keep that issue at bay. Um, praise God. But it's very easy in this moment, these moments when we're waiting for healing to feel dismayed and abandoned. But God is always faithful, and our hope is secure in him. If you're still waiting on your healing, place your hope and trust in Jesus and get some people to pray with you before you leave. Amen. I hope this is stirring your faith. We're not too far from the end now. So in many ways, these were my... Next slide, please. These were my... This was one of my dad's favourite songs, My Living Years. Because... As this song implies, if you know this song, I was kind of really going through a lot of personal pain, losing both my parents at quite a young age, as was the, my other siblings. And yet, I just had this sense of sort of belief and optimism in the future that God was going to, if we continued to, if we didn't recoil, but we continued to put our hands to the plough, hold on and keep moving forward, that God would do great things. Too many people recoil. And I didn't want to be a shrinking violet. I was like, come on, let's, we're going to see great things happen in the land of the living. We've seen some, you know, we've shown, had to show resolve for that. And there's one of the things that we really need in our world right now, particularly a lot of younger people, particularly people under, say, I don't know, 45, 50. We, but all of us need it to an extent. We need resolve. We need a desire to persevere through the difficult times, to trust God through the rubbish and believe he's the God of all seasons of life, the good and the bad. We've seen some great things in the church over the years. We've seen new people. We've seen new people come and added onto teams. We've got our own building in the last ten, within the last 10 years. I can't believe, I have to remind myself there was a time when we didn't have it. We've been able to strengthen our position as a church financially, been able to position our links and ministry within the, commu the communities that we serve. We've been able to continue to reach out and be a part of things locally, nationally and abroad as well. God says this to the communities that we serve. He said it then and he says it now. Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he wants you and I to respond and continue to respond and continue 
to give ourselves to him again and again and again by learning to love him and love his people, including the ones you don't like. The next section is um, it's taking us into 2020, and the year before that, 2019, uh, word of a worrying disease began to spread from China and then into Europe, particularly Italy, I remember. I was never like overly concerned about it. I'm like, it's one of these things that will turn out to be a load of fuss about nothing. <laughs> really was, wasn't it? Real big load, fuss load of nothing. Billions of pounds and lots of lockdowns later. March um, 2020, we ended up in a national lockdown and locked out of our church building. Pete and I met up um, where all good pastors meet up in Weatherspoons, coffee only, a few days before the lockdown and said, we need to get Pete's wise words were, we need to get ahead of the change curve. What do we need to do in case this happens? There's lots of rumours of lockdown. And we were soon in the point, thankfully we had plans to put into place, but we were soon in the point where we weren't legally allowed to gather. If we tried to gather as church, we, we could have gone to prison. Trustees could have gone to prison. I might say for Tom, maybe that's the best place for him. I was joking, oh, joking, Tom. joking. He's not here, so I can... We did as much as we could. We did the best we could. I've never worked harder than I did during lockdown. For a, about two hours when we went to lockdown, I thought, do you know what, this might be like a little holiday if we get some peace and quiet. <laughs> and it was the hardest time of my work in life. Really was. We did our best to do what we could to reach out as much as we could. We worked really hard to be reflective and learn lessons where we needed to, to how we could do things better. We began live streaming uh, first recording and then live streaming services. We got better at things, bought new equipment as time went on. And COVID was such a huge challenge. And we did our best. And God did some amazing, amazing things. When we were allowed to kind of come back into church services and gatherings in 2021, some people returned. Some new people came. Some people didn't come back. Some people have never returned to any church. And it makes me wonder, what did COVID reveal that was actually underneath that veneer? I'll just leave that question hanging. It was hard, but as Elton John once sang, we're still standing. I'm still standing. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6 and 10, 13. Firstly, 3 verse 6. I was reminded of these during lockdown. I planted, said the Apostle Paul, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such that is common to, to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow, allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. I'm aware that we've been talking a while, we really are coming to land, but why don't you just wiggle in your seats, just check you're all still listening to me, yeah, that's good, get yourselves a, a little jiggle on. I want to talk to you about um, the years, the last few years, and it's called The Kids Aren't All Right by Offspring. Over the years, our children have faced many challenges, as in our actual children, um, with their health and well-being. Just in the last few years, we've faced serious mental health challenges, repeated dislocations of Alfie's shoulder, ongoing health conditions with his tummy, life-changing burns for Bella, and all the things that society can throw at our young people as a side order. As a parent, this can be extremely heartbreaking, worrying, and exhausting, hence the title, The Kids Aren't All Right. But many years ago, we chose to commit our children into the hands of God. We trust him with them, even when things looked hopeless. We took very seriously the challenge in Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you're tempted to worry about your children and... Cons and Bring that worry and concern to the Father. He knows what it's like to be a parent. Express your concerns to him and then leave them at his altar. And he will replace your worries with peace. This may sound a bit twee, but I promise it's the only option. Sometimes these prayers are through tears. 
Sometimes they look like spiritual battle. The amount of times I have paced in my kitchen declaring the goodness of God and his salvation for my children, and I've been angry and shouting and crying, that's okay too. So let's not think that this is just a nice, easy, twee thing. But God hears our prayers. I've always been encouraged by the words in Jeremiah uh, 31 where it says, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy, so there is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. We partner with God to do all that we can to help our children be safe and healthy and to walk with the Lord. But they have their own experiences and their own free will. So we must trust the Lord to look after them and protect them. Love your kids with all your heart. Do everything you can to steward them well and pray to the almighty God for he loves them too. Oh God. So to present day. The times, they are a-changing. Bob Dylan, one of my dad's favourite artists. Personally, ministry and following in the footsteps and the slipstream of my father, something like that really takes its toll. And being really honest, in um, by sort of midpoint of 2022, I started to feel, to say I was incredibly weary was an understatement. I was shattered emotionally, physically, spiritually. And um, okay. um, I knew I needed to take some time off. Kelly and Pete had been telling me for months, and I was like, no, I'll be all right. He's stubborn. Yeah, <laughs> stubborn as a mule. But uh, I eventually cracked. I said, okay. So, and I'm very grateful to the core leaders and trustees and our staff team and everyone who's helped out for this. And apologies again to Pete for dumping loads of work on you <laughs> that you didn't need to do, that, that were, were, wasn't originally yours to do. But I knew I needed to take some time off. So November to January, November 2022 to January 2023, we had a sabbatical and intentionally kept a, a real distance from church things so that we could just relax, uh, get refreshed. And we went into it thinking, well, we'll just get recharged for the next season that's ahead of us. And... However, God, but God, he had other ideas. We had a number of prophetic words over a period of time, and particularly during this period. And um, what we sensed through prayer and through reading scripture, we began to pick up that perhaps God was calling us on to pastures new. I had this feeling for a while that the church needed some change, the church needed to grow and mature into its next phase and that it and I just had this real sense that I wasn't and I was okay about this but I wasn't the character to do it but it needed someone new a different direction and that became clear that that's what it needed and this is what the church already has and is and is getting I had some we had some conversations as we we got a clearer sense of things ourselves and came to the conclusion that, that the times they were were changing and that God was moving us on. This is bittersweet because it's bitter because I think back and I think of the history, I think of the times, I think of the, even just the streets around here that I drive around and I associate the names of people who've lived on those streets, who've been part of the church or have known in some way. I associate the, lo the locations that the church, this church has met in. So even though we don't meet there now, I just think of them as such fondness and happy memories. That pioneer spirit to step out and establish a church in this area. Hmm. I'll miss this part of my calling and my life. So these bits are, in a sense, bitter, but the sweet bit of the bittersweet comes when I know and I remember that whatever God asks of me, whatever God asks of you in your life, if it's hard or it's scary or if it seems easy, if you're brave and you embrace what he's calling you to, 
You only get one life. And you need to choose who and what you're going to live it for. I just see too many people in this world. And life is passing them by. Like John Lennon once said, life is what happens when you're making other plans. I don't want this to be any of you. And I get this feeling this morning that some of you just need to grasp hold of that and say, I don't know how much time I have left. It might be years or decades. It might not be very much long at all. But what I have, I'm going to live for God and I'm going to do whatever he's called me to do, even if it's scary or even if I don't like it or even if it's uncomfortable. Because when you're at the centre of his will, even in the middle of a storm, that is the safest place you can be. It's not always easy. In fact, it rarely is easy in my experience, but God can make all things well and all things new as well. And so we are here at the final countdown by Europe. With only one week to go, it's heart-wrenching and sad, but it's also extremely exciting because God has plans and purposes for James and I and our family, but also for Life, Life Church. So as we step boldly into this new season, I am reminded of the words of Joshua 1.9, which has been an important scripture for our family church. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Change can be scary and uncertain, but God. God knows all things, and we have certain hope in him. I wonder if the band want to come back whilst James yeah. finishes off. Oh, no, Mila's asleep. <laughs> can I invite all of you to stand as the, if you're able to do so? And I'll finish things off very quickly. I want to say to all of you this morning, it's been our honour and privilege. It's been our honour and privilege to worship with you. And this, when I'm saying this, I'm saying a very general you. There's so many people who aren't even alive now who we with people in other churches, people other parts of the country, parts of the world. It's been our honour and our privilege to worship with you, to believe God with you, to serve you, and see this church, this great church, which has a huge destiny, further established. As we move forward, as we move forward, we're doing so moving forward together. We might not always move forward side by side in a physical sense. But we move forward side by side in God's kingdom. Because God has great plans for all of us. There's only one church, the Church of Jesus Christ. There's only one church meeting across the city of Lincoln across the whole world today just one church in many different locations and congregations God has great plans in store for everyone but we need to embrace them we need to make a choice that we're going to do that and I promise you I'm not just saying this but I believe with all my heart that there has never been a more exciting time to be a part of Life Church Lincoln. Because there are things that are going to happen this week, this month, this year, and on and on and on until Jesus comes back. God is going to surprise you. God's going to challenge you. God's going to encourage you and he's going to strengthen you and he's going to bring more people into this family. I've seen so much from a distance, so much change take place in this last four months and I'm delighted and I'm only sorry that I can't be a direct part of it. But, just indulge me in one more moment. The other week, at, and I, this is how I feel about what you're going to experience at close quarters which I might only hear of from a distance. We will come back after a time. We're going to let you all get settled. A 
few weeks ago, Alfie and I were at the football, and um, as they'll tell you, I, I've got like the weakest bladder in the world. I think I probably need to go to the doctor, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> told you I'd be honest. And I missed um, the only goal of the game. And I got back to my seat, having heard the roar from the confines of the toilets. And I got back to Alfie, and he embraced me, and he said, I can't believe you missed that. It was such a great goal. And I said, Alfie, I don't care. I just care that it went in. I'm going to miss not seeing what God's doing at exceptionally close quarters. But in a sense, I don't care. I just care that it happened. I just care that God's going to do great things here. In the future, as we move into the future, your success, we will count as our own because we're kingdom people. And we pray that whatever we do for God in the future, that you will look on and say, that's our success as well. I want to encourage you to say in every time of your life, but God, but God, but God can, God has, God will, God will continue to do great things. Keep believing for more, for his victory, for a fresh wind of his Holy Spirit to blow through your life. Keep believing God for the impossible. I want to thank and love and bless every single one of you. We love you all and we're cheering you on. Thank you, Lord, for this great church and I pray that you will continue to bless it. And we pray that you'll hope, hope and pray you'll come next Sunday, three o'clock, for our final service of thanks and celebration to God for everything that we've seen. Thank God for his, this adventure we've been on and for everything that's yet to come. But God, he can do more. I leave you with these words, the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 15, 13. Life Church, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you and amen. This is our Ebenezer.